Hello and welcome to Cisco ASA Training 101. My name is Don Crawley. I'm from SoundTraining.net. We're the Seattle, Washington-based provider of accelerated training and publisher of learning resources for IT professionals. This time we're doing Cisco ASA Security Appliance Initial Setup. It's based on Chapter 1 in my book, The Accidental Administrator, Cisco ASA Security Appliance. The book is not required for the video, but if you'd like to get a copy to follow along, it's available through Amazon and other resellers, or you can visit our website at www.soundtraining.net slash bookstore and pick up a copy. The ASA software version that we're going to be using is version 9 and ASDM is version 7.0. If you're using an earlier version, there will be some differences, but the video should still be relevant for you. Uh, the basic procedures haven't changed since the ASA was released back in the mid-2000s. Since this is a 101 level video, uh, here's the basic concept of a firewall. What we want to do is we want to limit where connections can be initiated, and that's the important concept here. So a firewall allows your internal users to initiate a connection to, say, the public internet, maybe a website or a mail server or FTP server, something like that, but it prohibits internet users from being able to initiate a connection to the internal network. And that, at its core, is what a firewall is all about. Now you take a sophisticated device like a Cisco ASA security appliance and certainly can do lots more than just that, but at its core, that is basic firewall functionality. Now we can break firewalls down into two broad families. There's desktop and network firewalls. Here's the difference. A desktop firewall is typically a software application that is installed on a computer, such as what you're seeing here, the Windows 8 firewall. A network firewall is a typically a purpose-built device. You, you can certainly install network firewall software on a general purpose PC, but it's typically a purpose-built device, such as what you see here with the Cisco ASA family of firewalls. The difference is that a desktop firewall is designed to protect an individual node on a network, and a network firewall is placed at the network edge and it's designed to protect an entire network. One question that comes up frequently in my classes and just in discussions in general, especially with people who are new to networking, is if I have a network firewall, such as a Cisco ASA, at the edge of my network, do I need to install the desktop firewall software? Do I need to activate it on my individual computers in my network? And the answer is yes, 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 you do, because... Depending on the statistic, I've read varying numbers, but the, the point is that a, a large percentage of of security breaches are caused from internal sources and a network firewall would have nothing to do with something like that. Maybe you have a user who brings in an infected uh, USB uh, flash drive or or since this is a BYOD, bring your own device world today that we live in, maybe they bring in an infected system and uh, say a worm is released into your network and systems that aren't protected with a desktop or an application firewall like that uh, would be subject to uh, compromise and so a desktop firewall protects your internal systems while a network at the edge uh, a network firewall at the edge of your network protects all of the network in general but it's not going to have any effect on somebody bringing in an infected CD-ROM drive for example so you need both now one other comment on this before we move on a lot of times people will say well that's such a pain to configure and I've got to manage them and, and they complain about that well but that's what tools like Microsoft Group Policy are designed for so if you're new to network working, one of the best gifts you can give yourself is to learn how to use centralized management tools such as group policy. I'm not going to go into any more detail on that, but but the, the point of this slide is that you need both. You need a desktop firewall to protect your individual nodes and a network firewall at the edge to keep the bad stuff out of your network. The Cisco ASA family of firewall starts with the small office home office version, which is the 5505. That's the one you see in the upper right-hand corner of the graphic. And it goes all the way up through the, the 5510, 20, 40, 50, the X series, such as 5515X, uh, all the way up into the 5580, 85 series, uh, which are designed for provider class uh, uh, applications. Uh, we're going to be doing the demo using a 5505, but again, what I'm going to show you should be relevant no matter which version of the ASA software you're working with or, or the ASA platform you're working with. Let's take a look at the front of the 5505, then we'll take a look at the back. In the lower left-hand corner, you see a USB 2.0 port that is inactive, and it's reserved for future use. It's been reserved for future use since the ASAs first came out back in the mid-2000s, so I'm not sure what Cisco's planning to do with that. I, you would think that by now it would be active for something, but it's not. 
Then moving along, there are eight indicator lights along the top that indicate link activity and eight along the bottom that indicate that you're connected at fast Ethernet speeds. Then on the right-hand side, there's a power indicator, meaning the unit is receiving power. Uh, a status. If it's flashing, that means the unit is booting. If it's solid, then the unit is either booted or it's nearly booted. Active means it's processing traffic. VPN means that it has a VPN connection. And SSC means that there is a, a card in the security services card slot on the back. Let's take a look at the back. So here is the back of an ASA 5505, and in the upper left-hand corner you see the security services card slot. That is for adding uh, additional functionality through cards. The lower left-hand corner, there's the power port, and then there are eight Ethernet ports. And this is counterintuitive. Listen carefully. They are numbered from right to left, not the way you'd expect them to be. So the port number 0 is on the far right, and the port number 7 is on the far left. Typically, we connect the outside to port 0 and the inside to ports 1 through 7. You can configure it however you want, but that's the default configuration. Also, you need to be aware of the fact that port 6 and 7 are PoE enabled. So if you have, say, a, an IP phone or um, an access point or a switch that is PoE powered, then you can plug it into either of those two ports and power it off of the ASA. Continuing to the right, there are two more USB 2.0 ports that are reserved for future use. They are inactive as of the timing of this video. And then there's a Cisco console port, so you'll need to get a Cisco console cable. If you cringe at the thought of working in the command line, get over it, because when you're working with Cisco devices, there will be times where you'll have to go into the command line and type some commands. It's not that difficult, um, and so make sure you've got a Cisco console cable. Far right, there's a security lock slot, and then right below that is a reset button. The reset button, like the USB ports, is reserved for future use. So as of right now, at least based on my research that I did prior to producing the video and, and experimenting in my lab, it still does nothing. You can push it and nothing will happen. Now, there's an important concept that you need to understand relative to Cisco security appliances, and that is the concept of security levels. We assign security levels to interfaces, and then uh, the traffic can flow from a network behind a security level that is high to a network behind a security level that is low, relatively unimpeded. So here you see the office LAN, the interface connected to the office LAN has a security level of 100, and the Internet's interface has a security level of zero. That simply means that traffic can flow from the office LAN to the Internet fundamentally unimpeded, but not the other way around. Again, it kind of goes back to the first slide that we showed you about initiating connections. In other words, you can initiate a connection from the office LAN to of the Internet because the office LAN is a security level of 100, but not from the Internet to the office LAN. Now, one comment before we go on. You may notice that the DMZ has a security level of 50, and there's a web server and a mail server up in the DMZ in the upper left-hand corner. So you're thinking, well, okay, so how does an Internet user get to the web server in the DMZ, since the DMZ has a security level of 50 and the Internet has a security level of zero? And the answer is we poke a hole in the firewall using a combination of an access control list and a static NAT statement to allow specific traffic flows to get to either the web server or the mail server. Now, we're not going to go into any more detail on that, but just for right now, just know that that is possible and that that's how that works. Prerequisites for this lesson, you should have the following. Unrestricted privilege mode access to a Cisco ASA security appliance. The one I'm using is a 5505. You'll want it configured as a DHCP server, which will happen automatically when you apply the default configuration. But if for some reason you don't want a DHCP server in there, then you'll need to manually assign an IP address to your management workstation. And that's the next requirement is a computer for your management workstation. Uh, I'm going to be using a computer running Microsoft Windows 8, but you could use an older version of Windows or a Mac or a Linux system. You'll also need an Ethernet cable, a Cisco console cable, and if your uh, management workstation doesn't have a COM port on it, and let's face it, most of them don't today, then you'll also need a USB to serial adapter. And here's a picture of the Cisco console cable. Uh, they're uh, pretty widely available. You can make them if you want to. You can get them on eBay or you can buy a new one from Cisco, but they're pretty pricey from Cisco. You also, if you don't have a COM port on your PC, then you'll need a USB to serial adapter, such as the one I'm showing you on the far right. 
uh, be careful on which one you get. If you get a cheap one, a lot of times you'll have problems with uh, the, the chipset not being compatible with the Windows operating system or whatever operating system you're using. So you just want to be prepared to spend, you know, maybe 35 or 40 bucks to get a good one and uh, make sure that it is, if you're using it with Windows, that it is logo certified. Now here's the network diagram that we're going to be working from. As you can see, it's pretty simple. We've got a serial console cable connected from the management workstation, uh, either the uh, COM port or through a USB to serial adapter to a USB port on the management workstation, going to the console port on the firewall. And then we also have an Ethernet cable connected to port 1, not port 0, on the ASA. That's confusing, so let's just take a quick look at it. Here's the back of the ASA, and you want to connect to port 1. That's the second from the right port on the back of the ASA. Here's your disclaimer. This video is provided solely as a courtesy to you, our viewer. There are no guarantees whatsoever. Please do not attempt these procedures on a production firewall without first testing them for security and suitability in a lab environment. These procedures will destroy your firewall's existing configuration. So if uh, you're doing this on a firewall that's already configured, you may want to do a backup, and we'll cover that in a different video. Also, performing these procedures may open your firewall to the public Internet and subject your network to attack. So make sure you have current backups. Take precautions including data encryption and additional access controls to protect sensitive data. Just generally good advice anyway. So here we go. Let's uh, start by erasing the existing configuration. Now, that may not be something you want to do, but I want to demonstrate this with a completely clean configuration. So you'll notice the prompt is showing ASA01. That's an arbitrary host name that I gave to the ASA. And we're going to go into privilege mode. So I'll type EN, which is short for enable. And it prompts me for the password. I don't have a password on this one since it's just in my lab. So I just hit enter, and now I'm in privilege mode. The difference is that in user mode, where I have limited access to commands, the prompt is a greater than sign. And in privilege mode, where I have all access to all commands, the prompt is a pound sign. Now, we're going to erase the existing configuration with the command write erase, which I can abbreviate with WR space ER. That's short for write erase. And it's going to prompt me, and I'm going to confirm by hitting enter. It whirs for a moment, and it says, OK, you've done it. You've blown away the configuration and flash memory. Now, the, the firewall will continue to function because right now the configuration lives in dynamic RAM. But as soon as I power cycle or reload the device, it's going to try to read its saved configuration from flash memory, and it's not there. Let's just take a look. Let's do the command show startup config. I could abbreviate that show start. and Notice that it says no config. So we're going to say reload no confirm, and that's going to reload the device without asking for confirmation. There it goes. And we'll do a quick edit and come back when it's completely reloaded and ready for us to work with. So now through the miracle of uh, digital editing, we've rebooted in record time. And you can see that there's a prompt at the bottom that says pre-configure the firewall now through interactive prompts. And you actually could go through that process, but uh, we're not going to do that for the purpose of the video. So I'm going to say no. And now uh, let's go into privilege mode. Notice that the prompt has changed, by the way. It now says Cisco ASA. That's because the old config is completely gone. In fact, uh, let's go ahead and go into privilege mode, EN, short again for enable. There's no password, so we'll just hit enter. And let's do the command show startup config, which we can abbreviate show start. Again, there's still no configuration. Now let's go into global configuration mode with the command configure terminal, which we can abbreviate just conf space t. And uh, it's asking if we want to enable anonymous error reporting. And maybe you do, maybe you don't. For our purpose in the video, I'm going to say no. Cisco would appreciate it if you would. But again, that's a personal preference. And we're going to issue the command config factory default to apply a default configuration to the security appliance. And then we can go in and modify it in the GUI. But right now, let's just issue the command config factory default. Notice that I've just typed config space fact. And I'm going to touch the tab key. And notice that it just completes the command for me. That's pretty slick. And I could, by the way, provide an IP address here if I want to change the uh, management interface on my security appliance. I could put in the IP address right now and, and it would apply that to the management interface. But I'm going to say just leave it as is and use the defaults. So we'll go ahead and hit enter. Watch what happens now. 
it's applying the factory default configuration. It doesn't prompt me. It doesn't say, hey, we're about to mess with your config. It doesn't say, are you sure? It just does it. So be aware of that. We're going to touch the space bar at each of the more prompts. And almost done. And now it is. It's complete. And let's go ahead and save this with the command write, which is short for write mem. So I can just type wr. And now let's take a look at the saved configuration now. Show start. And see, now it has a configuration in flash memory. So if there were a power event or we reloaded the firewall, it would come back and it would actually have a configuration on it now as opposed to before where it didn't. I'll touch Q to break out of this. And we're all set. Um, let's go ahead and bring up a browser and take a look at running the ASDM, the Adaptive Security Device Manager, and continuing the configuration through that. So we've got Internet Explorer open. You can use a different browser, but I've had better luck with Internet Explorer in, in using the ASDM than the other two browsers, Chrome and Firefox. Personal preference, I recommend use IE. I think you'll find it's a little less problematic, but uh, again, personal preference. We're going to type in HTTPS, and that's important. You must use Secure HTTP to connect to the firewall, otherwise you'll end up with an error. We're going to type in the IP address of the inside interface. So that's going to be 192.168.1.1. That's the default. If you've configured it with some other address, then you'll need to use that. We'll go ahead and hit Enter. And you get a security warning. Um, just click through that. In the real world, you may want to check and make sure that you're connecting to where you think you are. Now, notice down at the bottom, it says this web page wants to run the following add-on, and it's asking if it's okay to run Java. You need to do that. So we'll click on Allow. And notice what happens now to the ASDM splash page. It gives us three options. One is to install the ASDM launcher, and we're not going to do that for this video, although I do have another video where I show you how to do that. You could also run ASDM, or you can run the startup wizard. Really, there's not a lot of difference between running ASDM and running the startup wizard other than run startup wizard, runs ASDM, and then it starts the startup wizard. So that's what we're going to do. Click on the run startup wizard button and go through the process of starting Java. And you'll get some certificate warnings. That's fairly normal. And just make sure you know what you're connecting to. We'll click on yes. And now it's asking us for our username and password. Well, we didn't configure one, so we'll just simply click OK. And it's going to whir for a moment. And then it'll come back and actually start the ASDM, and then it will kick in the uh, startup wizard as well. And here it goes. We'll get a warning about letting Cisco know uh, reporting about errors and how we use it. We'll bypass that. There's the warning. We'll, it's called uh, Smart Call Home, and we'll just not enable that. Cisco would like us to, but uh, for the purpose of the video, we're going to bypass that. Click on OK, and there's our startup wizard. Just finished getting the data from the device, and now we're ready to go. Now you'll notice that we have two options. One is to modify the existing configuration or reset the configuration to the factory defaults. And since we've already reset it to the factory defaults, we just want to modify the existing configuration, tweak it a little bit. So we'll click on Next. And notice that it says configure the device for teleworker usage as an option. That would allow us to set it up uh, for remote access, VPN usage, and uh, remote management, that sort of thing. We're not going to do that. We're just going to configure it as a standalone device. This is just setting up the, the very basic ASA like it's configured in thousands, maybe millions of offices, small offices, and home offices around the world. Now let's give it a host name. And so I'm just going to call it ASA01. I'm not feeling particularly creative here, so we'll go with that. And now we'll choose our domain name. You'll probably want to use something other than what I'm using, but I'll use my company name. We'll change the privilege mode password. This is the uh, password that you use to get into privilege mode. That's what the name says. And so you want to use something fairly robust, whatever you choose. So I'm going to put in just one that I like to use for this purpose. And we'll click Next. Next. 
Now it's uh, a page about configuring VLANs. If you're working with a 5510, 20, 40, 50, one of the X series, uh, you're not going to see this. But for the 5505, since it has a built-in 8-port switch and the interfaces that it uses are uh, physical interfaces that are made members of VLANs, we have to configure the VLANs. And um, so we'll, we'll configure two of them. We're not going to configure the DMZ. So we'll just choose Do Not Configure for the DMZ, and we'll clear this checkbox, and we'll click Next. Now it's asking for us to assign switch ports to VLANs, and we're going to go with the default configuration, but I just want to point out that by default it associates Ethernet 0 slash 0, that's the port 0, the, the farthest rightmost port on the back of the firewall, with the outside VLAN, which is VLAN 2 by default. And it associates ports 1 through 7, or as it labels them Ethernet 0 slash 1 through 0 slash 7, with VLAN 1, the inside VLAN. We don't need to make any changes here, so we'll simply click Next and go on. Now it's asking us to uh, assign IP addresses to the interfaces, and we're going to use DHCP to get our IP address on the outside VLAN. If you need to assign a static, then you can uh, push the radio button that says use the following IP address and put in whatever address you need and, and the appropriate mask. But we're going to use DHCP. There's one thing we need to do here, and that is to check the box for obtain default route using DHCP. And we want to do that. Um, typically, we would do that, I think, because uh, we're going to get that from our um, our ISP, and we want to use their router as the uh, as, as the default route, and so I think for most most of the time you'll want to do that. Now let's do the inside, and we can just leave it at the default. Um, if you need to change it for some reason, then go ahead and do that, but I think most of the time you'll probably leave it as the default, and we'll click Next. Now we're enabling the DHCP server, and as you can see by default it wants to do that on the inside interface. The only thing that we really need to configure here are uh, how it's going to get the DNS settings and uh, maybe you want to check the box for enable auto configuration from the interface. If you do that, it's going to pull all of those settings from your ISP's DHCP server. I tend to like to use open DNS for my DNS servers, so I'm going to set that up here, but this is really a matter of personal preference for you. So open DNS, if you're not familiar with it, uh, just uh, search on it and you'll see what it's about, but it's a, a an, an open DNS server that anybody can use, so I'm going to enter their two DNS servers, 208.67.222.222 for the first one, and for the second one, 208.67.220.220. We don't need to configure a WinS server. If you need to do that, you'll know what the address is, but most of you probably won't need to do that. Our lease length we're going to set to one day, so that's 86,400 seconds, which is the default. Our ping timeout we're going to set to 50 milliseconds, again the default. Oops, I mistyped that. And our domain name, this is the domain name that's handed out to the DHCP clients, and I'll set that again to soundtraining.net. You'll probably want to use your own. And now we're ready, so we'll click on Next. Next is using port address translation, and probably you're going to want to use port address translation. And in order to do that, we'll simply push the radio button that says Use Port Address Translation, and we'll accept the default of Use the IP address on the outside interface. What this is, this allows all of your inside clients to share an IP address on the outside, and that's the typical configuration. You know, if you're using a little Linksys or a Netgear uh, home router, that's what it does. And, and so for most purposes, this is what you're going to want to do. If you need to do it a different way, you'll probably know that, and then you can configure it accordingly. We'll click on Next. Now this is the page where we configure administrative access, and it's all set up. This is simply saying um, who can connect to the ASDM, and it's fine as it is, so we'll click on Next. And it's giving us a summary of what we've done, and take a look at it, make sure it's what you expect. And when you're satisfied, click on Finish. Delivers the commands to the device, and now it wants a network password. Now, we don't have a username configured yet, so we'll tab down to the password field and enter the password that we just configured and click on Login. 
and away we go. In a moment, you'll see the ASDM with the new configuration. You can tell that it's the new configuration because, remember, we gave it a new host name, and if you look in the upper left-hand corner, it says the host name is now ASA01. A couple of other things that you probably want to do. Down at the very bottom, let's enable logging so you can see what's going on. That's handy when you're troubleshooting or just want to kind of see what's going on with the system. The other thing that I like to do is up under the Tools menu, click on Tools and go to Preferences. And there's an option to allow you to preview commands before the ASDM sends them to the device. And I like to do that just so I can see what the command line commands are. So we'll check that box that says preview commands before sending them to the device. We'll click on OK. And, and we're good. Now we've got a fully functioning ASA Security Appliance configured through the ASDM, and that's how you do the very basic configuration. We have other videos where we've shown you how to set up a VPN or how to set up DMZs and some of the other aspects of administration, but this is where it all starts. If you'd like more information, visit our website at www.soundtraining.net. I blog at soundtraining.net slash blog. Maybe I should say I rant at soundtraining.net slash blog blog, but either way. You can follow us on Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. If you'd like more videos, they're available on our video channel. We're adding new videos all the time, usually several a week, uh, at www.soundtraining.net slash videos. If you'd like the companion book, I'd love for you to have a copy of it. It's available through our bookstore at www.soundtraining.net slash bookstore, or you can find it at Amazon or through other internet resellers. Well, I hope it's been helpful for you. For SoundTraining.net, I'm Don Crawley. We'll see you next time.